I mean, God is accelerating raising the dead. I was over there in Germany, and I told the church that, and they raised a guy who had been dead for four days in the morgue. Now they're in a big old conference center. They, yeah, they were in a little bitty kind of a uh, building, and then God raised this guy from the dead, and now people are flocking in there. And it says many believe when they saw the miracles he did. Listen, we need miracles. Listen, I'm telling you, we need miracles. One time I was flying from uh, Moscow down to Vienna, Austria, and Billy Graham was on the plane. And uh, I'm standing in the aisle of the airplane with Billy Graham, and here's what I told him. I said, Dr. Graham, God has shown me that signs and wonders or miracles are going to be used in a mighty way to win the end-time harvest. He said, son, I believe every word of that. That's what he said. Then he put his hand right here on my shoulder. He said, let me tell you something about harvest time. I was reared on a farm, and one thing I know about harvest time, it's short. And we've got to get busy about the main thing. The main thing is winning souls. God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And boy, what we've got to do now is uh, we've got to get the message outside the four walls of the church. It says that Jesus went about. Wow, isn't that genius? He went about. Now, listen, this morning I poured boiling water in my hand, but I didn't get blistered. You know why? Stop on cup. It doesn't take much insulation to stop a process. Four walls will do just fine. If we keep the gospel inside four walls, it doesn't affect the people that need to hear it. How can they get saved if then uh, we got to preach the gospel, hadn't we? Wasn't that wonderful? Like I love the guitar player. When he walked by, I gave him a verse out of the Bible. Psalms 144, verse 1. He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. When he picks up that guitar, that's not just a guitar, that's a weapon. Isn't that something? He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Psalms 144, verse 1. Now, listen, prophets are supposed to know the timing. Uh, now, here, if, if, I, if I could just, if I, if I had a big old uh, board up here, I'd draw you something. Now, watch my hands and see, see if you can see what I'm doing. Right, it goes just like that. goes down and has a question. Or, it's a question mark. That's where the church is right now. We're going, who, where are we? Who are we? What are we going to do? And God's about to turn our question mark into an exclamation point. Aren't you ready? God wants us to be ready. I'm telling you, he has equipped us with everything we need. Colossians, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, All that God is, is in Christ. The Bible said, It pleased the Father that the fullness of deity would dwell in Jesus Christ permanently. So Colossians 2, 9 says, All that God is is in Christ. You go, I believe that. Well, do you believe Colossians 2, 10? All that Christ is is in you. we got to get rid of this stinking thinking. Did you know the devil and God both are asking you the same question? How could holy God and hateful devil be synchronized in asking you the same question? Here's the question. You ready? Who do you think you are? Hell's going, who do you think you are? Heaven's going, who do you think you are? As a person thinks, that's how they'll be. Remember in the book of Numbers when God said, go take the land. It flows with milk and honey. And they did like a lot of church members. They got uh, uh, committed together to see if God knew what he's talking about. Said, let's send, send in some spies. Remember the story? Long story short, when they got there, oh, man, the fruit was just like God said. It was overflowing. It was massive. And it says that it was flowing with milk and honey. Remember, a stalk of grapes was so big, the soldiers had to put it on a spear to carry it out. Big fruit. But then here's the problem. It says, yeah, it was just like this, flowing with milk and honey. But we saw giants in the land. And when we analyzed our sip against the giants, we perceived our sip as grasshoppers. Here's what your Bible said. Because they perceived themselves as grasshoppers, the enemy had the privilege of seeing them as grasshoppers. Now, we've got to answer the question, who are we? We're, 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 well, we're giants. Yeah, here we go. Joshua 1 9. Joshua 9, 1 9 says, Be bold, be brave, be very courageous, go do what you're called to do because you're not going by yourself. The book of Jeremiah says, The Almighty God is coming. He's coming with you wherever you go. I mean, that's all you need, isn't it? Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk about uh, I asked three questions all over the whole earth. If not now, when? If not here, where? If not you, who? Now, if not now, when? See, a lot of people are paralyzed by the past. Oh, if I'd lived in Wigglesworth Day, if I'd lived in A.A. A. Allen's Day, if I'd lived in William Brandon's Day. You didn't. You're living now. And see, they're paralyzed by the past. Some are, are paralyzed by the future. Somewhere out there, the whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Well, uh, that's true. It's going to be there. But some are fantasizing about the future. But I love the little word now, N-O-W. 
It blockades the pathway of the past, barricades the pathway of the future, and traps us in the present. You and I need a move of God when? Now. now. That's what it says, Hebrews 11. 1. Now, faith is substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. If the church needs anything, we need substance and evidence. We can't keep talking about a God we can't prove. He wants to show up and show off. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much in trembling. He said, my speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of God's power. It was never the plan of God to establish the kingdom of God with mere verbiage. 1 Corinthians 4.20 said, the kingdom of God doesn't consist with just mere words, but God demonstrated deeds. So we need that anointing upon us, don't you think? Not one single miracle is recorded in your New Testament that Jesus did until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. What? Not one single miracle recorded in the New Testament that Jesus did and he was filled until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Nearest thing to it, teaching astonishing people with what he knew. Acts 10, 38 says God did something. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? Holy Ghost and with power. See, you can't, you can't have power without the Holy Ghost. Jesus, Jesus said, you need the anointing. You know why? We're supposed to be doing the same things he did, only bigger. These works that I do and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Wow. Now, he means that. These are not just words. These are challenges. Now, I want you to start realizing who you are. The question was, who do you think you are? 2 Corinthians 5.20. 2 Corinthians 5.20 is, here's that English word again, N-O-W. Now are we ambassadors for Christ. That's what it says now. Are we ambassadors? So it would behoove us to find out what in the heck is an ambassador. If that's what we are. Now, here's what it said when he, when he wrote ambassador. It's, it means a senior representative sent out with authority. A senior representative sent out with authority. I don't know about you, but my mind goes, okay, how much authority do I have? I have the same amount as the one that sent me. How much, how much does he have? All power, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. We try to find out that there's no need to wait. There's no delay. I'm telling you, now is the day. So we're talking about if not now, when? The Bible said today if you hear his voice. 2 Corinthians what, 6, 2 says, now is acceptable time. Now is the time of an assured welcome. Now is the time he'll hear you and help you. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now, when I, when I read the Bible, I read it out of the Amplified Classic. I'd suggest you do the same thing. Don't get the AMP. Get the AMPC. They're hard to find, but they're worth it. The AMPC, the, the, the AMPC is really good. See, I'll give it to you like Psalms 92.10, King James. You ready? My horn has been exalted like the horn of a unicorn. Heck, how many of them you seen? Yeah, yeah. But Psalms 92.10 in the Amplified, it said, My stately grace. Oh, I like that, don't you? Has been exalted. Banded like that of a wild ox. And I'm from Texas. I can work with a wild ox. I used to ride bulls in the rodeo. I got knocked out and heard Conway Twitty singing. <laughs> Woo! Getting knocked out was bad enough, but hearing Conway Twitty sing. Mm. Have, have you ever ridden a bull? Oh, it's awful. You, you know. You get on there and the bull's snorting and snot's going everywhere. And there's some idiot on the gate with a big old chitter rocker. And he goes, you ready? You go, yeah, you ain't ready. <laughs> they throw the gate open. It explodes. That's the longest eight seconds you'll spend. You in and out. But anyway, anyway, I, I wouldn't let my boys do it. But anyway, here's what I want to talk to you about. I want you to understand we have already won. All we've got to do is go pick up the spoils. God likes to do new things. Isn't it uh, Amos 3.7? Amos 3.7 says, Surely, absolutely, God will not do a single thing without first revealing what he's going to do to his servants, the prophets. Isaiah 48, verse 6 and 7 says, God said, I do a new thing. It's new now and not prior to now. So nobody would be blase going, I already know that. Isaiah 48, verse 6 and 7. God likes new things. If you want to see one of the newest new things in the Bible, 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20, that's where Jehoshaphat and the people of God were under great attack. It looks like it's a, 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 a situation that could not be solved or settled in any way. And here's what they do. Jehoshaphat calls an assembly. And he gets everybody praying, fasting, seeking God. The women, the soldiers, even those that suck the breast because what they're facing uh, touches every segment of society. And I think that Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 does something fantastic. 
in the midst of a people that are very confused, he stands up and begins to rehearse how good God has been in the past. Wow. Oh, Lord God. Oh, I'm screaming. Oh, Lord God. Are you not the God that drove out our enemy? So he stands in front of a bunch of confused people facing an insurmountable situation and begin to rehearse how good God had been in the past. And then here it gets to that 2 Chronicles 20, 12. 2 Chronicles 20, 12. It says, Oh, Lord, we don't know what to do against this great multitude that's come up against us, but our eyes are upon you. And as they were praying and fasting, seeking God, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon a prophet. And the prophet gets up and prophesies a new thing. He said, listen to me, Jehoshaphat, and all of you Judea, uh, in Judea. Here, and he, See, that's what people got to learn to listen to the prophets. Because not God, God's not going to do a single thing without first revealing what he's going to do to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. I like Amos 3, 8 too. A lion has roared in the streets. Who can but prophesy? It's time for us to soar so we can come back and roar, don't you think? That's what, that's what the shepherd job's about, teaching the people how to soar and roar. Listen. But anyway, so Jehoshaphat, uh, he, he, he said, the prophet said, listen to me, king. Listen to me, people. And then he gives them a new thing. He said, yeah, they're coming up. This, this insurmountable army, it's coming up through the ravine of Zin. They said, go out and challenge them. But don't send the soldiers, send the singers. First time in the annals of history. First time in the annals of history any war had been fought like that. If I'd have been in the council room, I'd have said, second opinion. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Because this thing's for all of the marbles. Whoever wins it takes over. Well, then here's that famous verse. Every one of you in this room probably have heard it. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Jehoshaphat the king stood and said, Trust the Lord, you'll be established. Believe his prophets and you'll prosper. Wow. Believe his prophets and you'll prosper. Look up the word prosper. It means live at God's highest pointed level for your life. That's why it's so important to bring the prophets in. Because number one, God's not going to do any new thing without them. Number two, they'll give you strategy, plans, and plot, plots for achieving the next move of God. Even though it seems, no, that couldn't be it. Don't send the soldiers, send out the singers. Wow. And listen, thank God for Jehoshaphat. He listened to what the prophet said. He sent out the singers. Man. Now, it says as they went out. Here's what the Bible said. God set an ambushment. Now, look that up in all your Hebrew words and ambushment. It's not really clear exactly what it is, but my God, it works. Hey! He sent out an ambushment. It says all these alien armies jerked out their swords, went nuts, kill one another, and then kill themselves. That's what it says. They kill each other and then kill themselves. God's people over there chilling out. Our God is an awesome God. <laughs> Just wearing it out, man. That's why they don't put me on the praise team, you know. When I do sing, I sing like Laurent. I really love you, darling. You're looking swell. Just a glow. I, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. I can hear you. You're going, don't give up your day job, Bobby. Yeah. Now, I don't like people that don't like to have fun. Well, brother, you don't know what I'm going through. The key is through. Through. Yea, the Lord, through. He won't leave you in the middle of your mess. My favorite verse in the whole Bible. My favorite verse in the whole Bible is Nahum 1.7. Nahum. The word Nahum means the one that brings consolation, encouragement. Nahum 1.7 says, God is good. Wow, you said that's so elementary. Now listen, I'm glad he didn't say God was good or he's going to be good. He is. Right in the middle of your mess, he's good. And said he's a very present help in the time of trouble. He knows those that are trusting him. They had to build a road to build my house on. They named it Nahum. So we live on Nahum Road in Moravian Falls, North Carolina. They got the land where I built my house in the 1700s and deeded it to Jesus Christ. Yes, the Moravians, Zinzendorf and those guys, they've had a 100-year prayer meeting 24 hours a day for 100 years. There's Moravian praying right now somewhere. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. But anyway, that's we got to find those ancient portals and occupy them. Portals, I don't know anything about portals. Revelation 4.1, 1, 
And after this, I heard a voice that said, Come up here. And I looked, and there was a gate, a door, a portal standing open. And that's an invitation. We can come up. Come up here. Wow. See, if we'll start operating from there more than here, it'll change how we look. Yeah. Ephesians 1 says, we're seated in heavenly places. Yeah. Wow. The Bible said, who has stood in my course to hear my counsel? Boy, I, I, I typed that once. I was doing one of the shepherd's rods, and I read in Jeremiah where it says, who has stood in my course to hear my counsel? And my, I said, Lord, I want to say with all my heart, I have. So I'm getting ready for that shepherd rod at, at that season. And the Lord said, uh, get your ticket and go to Stalinbosch, uh, South Africa. I said, Lord, speak to me, Moravian Falls. <laughs> Got me a ticket, took off to Stalinbosch. It was okay. They put me in a nice uh, house overlooking a vineyard, and I thought, this is going to be okay. It was quiet and really nice. Then the Lord said, I want you to get up and go get an airplane ticket and fly four hours out in the bush. So, okay, we get there, and then they put us in some kind of a vehicle. Oh, Lord. And drove us for about three hours through the bush, up and down, around, dusty, hot. My shirt is stuck to my chest. I'm hot as I, I could be in Moravian Falls. It's a, it's a portal. And it's cool up in the mountains. But now I'm somewhere out in the bush in Africa. I'm hot as I can be. I'd like to say I was praying in tongues. No, I wasn't. I was fussing. God, I'm hot. God, I'm hot. That's what I said to God. Like, you know, he, he needs to hear my whining. But anyway, my shirt stuck to me. And then we're out in the middle of the bush. And all of a sudden, my shirt started flapping. My pants legs were flapping. I looked at the trees. They're dead still. I thought, oh, no. You might ask, what brought the breeze? Seven angels brought the breeze. Seven angels came down. They joined hands around me. And they start in a circle like this. And they started spinning so fast it created a, a vortex and sucked me up to the courts of heaven. See, don't tell God, yeah, I want to go if you're not ready for a journey. Yeah. And anyway, there I am. These seven angels that came to get me, they're fierce looking. But I am standing at the gates of the courts of God. There's massive angels taller than this building, maybe 50 feet tall, and they all look mad. <laughs> Standing like this, guarding the gates like this. And then watch this. Every one of them in perfect synchronization turn their head like this. There I am down there with seven guiding angels, and here's these massive guarding angels. Ooh, they looked at me gleaning gleaming at me and here's what they said in unison speaking as one who have you brought to this gate now I am in a dilemma I wanted to disappear but I wanted to hear what they said also and so these seven guiding angels said to the massive guarding angels the question was who have you brought to this gate And here, here's what they said we brought the friend of the king. Now that's how I got to get into the courts of heaven. But the Bible said if we'll tend to what God has given us to do and minister to what he's told us to do, he'll give us open access to his presence. I'm telling you, unfettered approach to him. Listen, guys, we have got to unshackle from this world and start living from that world. The, the realm between the spirit realm and the natural realm is thinner than it's ever been. I was preaching the other day, and I pushed my hand like that, and it, it touched like what seemed like saran wrap. I said, Lord, what is this? And he called it a membrane. He said, it's a membrane between the natural world and the spiritual world, and it's thinner than ever. Yeah. You understand? See, Chuck saw the angel here last night. When you start praising God, God's angels come. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, listen, angels are excited about what God's planned for this nation. I'm telling you. The, we're at the, I think we're at the threshold of the greatest move of God we've ever seen. Uh, listen, listen. Uh, one of the things God is going to do is join the generations, the Joshua and the Caleb's. He, he's joining them. And so anyway, Bob Jones and I, y'all remember Bob Jones? He's in heaven watching this service today. Bob Jones, good, gracious. You talk about something. Had a third grade education. I've been in his house when NASA would call him and ask him what he saw. They said, we know you can see further than us. 
We was out in, a, out in his yard one time. He's messing with some strawberry plants. And he gets up and he goes, well, yep, I'm going in the house. I said, what you going in the house for? He said, a millionaire is going to call me. I said, who? He said, I don't know. I said, I'm going in the house with you. <laughs> so uh, we get to the door, and Bob's shoes was muddy, so he took his shoes off. He took a, a Ch Kansas City Chief baseball cap off, hung it on a nail, and he walked by the phone. <laughs> the phone rang. He picked it up and goes, yeah, uh-huh. This is Bob Jones. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh, okay. Well, here it is. You're a man ahead of your time. They would not buy what you've built, but you've turned your heart to the Lord, and he's getting you out of all this mess. Mm -hmm, yeah, I'm sure. All right, bye. <laughs> I said, who was that? He said, I don't know, some guy named John DeLorean. <laughs> yeah. The guy that invented the Back to the Future car, and nobody would buy it and got in big trouble, and then got, he turned his heart to the Lord, and God got him out of all that. Now, listen, Bob Jones... I saw, can I tell you how I met Bob Jones? It'll be insightful. Now, uh, 1994, I'd, I'd seen Bob Jones twice in a vision, once on a video. Never met him. 1994, I saw a huge rock coming through space, gigantic rock. God said, that's a sign my kingdom's coming to earth. Call Bob Jones and he'll tell you. So I didn't know Bob Jones. Seen him twice in a vision, once on a video. Ricky Skaggs, a country and western singer, he knew Bob. So Ricky gives me Bob's number. I lived in Texas. Bob lived in Chipley, Florida at that time. So I called Bob. Phone rang and it rang and it rang. I'm just about to hang it up. Bob goes, hello. I go, this is Bobby Connor. He said, I know who you are. You seen it, didn't you? I know who you are. You seen it, didn't you? I said, all right. Yes, I did. But you tell me what I saw. He said, you saw the big rock coming through space. I said, yes, I did. He said, you know what it means. I said, yes, I do, but you'll have to tell me. And he said it meant the kingdom of God coming. He told me the dominion, told Bob the kingdom. This was 1994. And so uh, that, that's Bob came to our church and preached. That's the first place he preached since he'd been in Kansas City. God joined us together. You talk about miracles, good, gracious, signs and wonders. Here's one. You'd, you'd like this one. Me and Bob was preaching in some kind of a coliseum thing, and they had chairs just like y'all are sitting in, and I'm supposed to be preaching, but I got to feeling athletic. <laughs> so I ran and jumped on the bottom of the chair just like that, and I was still stable. And I thought, wow, this is something. So I jumped on this part of the chair, and I'm stable as anything, just like a gymnast. I jumped right here, stable as anything. I jumped 18 rows out across this Coliseum, landing on the back of the chairs as stable as anything. 18 rows. Got in the middle of a bunch of rich looking black people, fell into them. They go, you okay? I go, probably not. <laughs> but see, that was supernatural. You can't do it. Give it a hop. Get up and give it a hop. See, when the morning's there, you can do, you can do supernatural things. I levitated while I was down there in Argentina. What? But I'd already prophesied to Rick Jordan. I said, one day I'm going to be 12 or 14 feet off the ground, standing on nothing, prophesying to the people. I'm down there in a basketball arena in uh, uh, Argentina. And uh, I'm up there preaching. And I was preaching about glory, the coming glory. And I, I, I had a hold of the pulpit. And all of a sudden, I felt weightless. And I'm about this high off the ground. I grabbed the pulpit and fell back down. The people went nuts. Two hours, they ran forward screaming, Glory, adios, throwing billfolds, backpacks, this deep on the platform. I said, I hope they know whose stuff this is. You know, but I like things that can't be explained, don't you? Here's what the Bible said. The natural mind, that's the one you have, receives not the things of the Spirit. It's foolishness to it. Neither can they know it. It must be spiritually discerned. I don't care how brilliant you are. The, the most simple thing from God is so profound, you can't get it with the natural mind. It has to be spiritually ingested. But, so anyway, God wants to do some new things. And this is one thing I'm, I'm absolutely sure of. God has given Chuck strategies to fulfill the plan of God for these days. Now, here's what the devil wants to do. In Daniel 7.25, well, sure it is. Daniel 7.25 says, The evil force intends to wear out the saints of God by accusing God. Daniel 7.25, he wants to wear out the saints of God, and here's one of the ways he does it. He causes us to get our face off of the Bible and look at the situations. Jesus said men's hearts failing them for the things they see coming up on the earth. Now, if you look out, chaos. If you look up, peace. Now, here's our, we got to have the power of focus. Here's what we've been, the problem is, we've been glancing at the, our resource and gazing at the problem. 
That ain't the way to do it. Glance at the problem, gaze at the resource. Isaiah 26, 3, he'll keep us in perfect peace. It will stay focused on him. So the devil will try to distract us and disturb us to get our focus off of God. On to the things. But listen, these are going to be some of the greatest times of victory you've ever seen in your life. You can feel the positioning. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. There are swift shifts and turbulent turns, but it's to get us to the place to embrace a new day. If God's doing anything, he's preparing us to embrace a new day. Psalms 30, verse 5. Psalms 30, verse 5 says, God's favor is for a lifetime. His anger is for a tiny moment. His favor is for a complete lifetime. It says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. There is a new day on the horizon. God is going to wake his bride up. We're going to be bold and brave and very courageous. We're going to be fearless. I'm telling you, the devil's more afraid of you than you are him. Yeah, Luke 10, 19, he said, be, Jesus said, behold, observe, look at this. I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and it'll in no wise hurt you. He uses two words there. He says, I give you authority to stop the devil's ability. The devil has John 10, 10. He comes to steal, kill, maim, destroy, but we've got power to bind him. When Jesus came up out of the grave in Revelation 1, he came up bringing something. Keys! See, the devil can't even lock his door. I can tell you, God wants us to pilfer the strong man. You bind the strong man and pilfer his house. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Boy, I tell you. Woo! Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I broke in jail. Not, no, I broke in jail. The guy, the, the judge that bought me my first preaching suit was a judge that used to lock me up. And listen, he, Judge Winston Reagan, he bought me my first preaching suit. And he came to me later. He said, uh, uh, do you know why I did that? And I said, no, sir. He said, now, I'm a Methodist, and Methodists don't talk like this. He said, a voice came to me. Yeah, but yeah, when I first started preaching, the whole couple of rows would be policemen. Yeah, uh, this is true. It's true. They just, but therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become bright and brand new. While, while the Chuck was prophesying over you, I, I, I thought of Psalms 40, verse 1. I waited patiently upon the Lord. He inclined unto me, he heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a solid rock. He established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth. He even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and trust the Lord. Before this whole thing's over, you'll be a flaming evangelist. Okay? That's right. That's good. Yeah. Isn't freedom good? Yeah. Woo! And God wants to, uh, it doesn't matter what, what you've been into, it's what God will get you out of. Colossians 1.13 says, He took us out of death and darkness and put us in to light and love. That's the biggest transition you'll ever make. Out of death and darkness into life and love. Anyway, so I really have enjoyed this. And this is, this. you understand, uh, we're on the threshold of God releasing a scepter to us. And it's going to be the, our words. We're going to forge the future with our words. We're going to bind the enemy with our words. We're going to declare what God wants to be established. And boy, I'll tell you what. We have not because we ask not. Now, I've been preaching, I told you, 50 years. Five times a week for 50 years. Other day, well, it wasn't the other day. It's maybe uh, six months ago. They rolled a little old lady up in a wheelchair. Chuck, I'm telling you, her little legs were small. Hadn't been out of the wheelchair in 32 years. Little old arms swiveled up like this. Rolled her right there in a meeting like this. So I'm looking at her. She's very, uh, very drawn up and very swiveled up and hadn't been out of the wheelchair in 32 years. So I said to God, Lord, what will you do with this woman? Guess what he said to me? What is it you want me to do with her? Just bounce the ball right back in my court. And I, I, till, till this moment, I don't know where that thought came from for me. He said, what do you want me to do? I said to God, I want her to jump up out of that wheelchair and throw her leg up as high as a rocket dancer. Now, 
When I said that, she jumps up out of the wheelchair, hadn't been out for 32 years, and threw her leg up as high as my shoulder. Got back in the wheelchair and they rolled her off. I said, God, what was that? And he said, don't you remember blind Bartimaeus? Blind Bartimaeus laying by the roadside. He hears that it's Jesus. They bring blind Bart in front of Jesus. Anybody in the house could have seen he's blind. And Jesus says, what is it you want me to do for you? Had Jesus lost the word of knowledge? No, he wants us to declare it. Declare, establish it with your proclamation and your declaration. Don't go around cursing yourself. Well, you know, nothing good ever happens to me. No, you're born again. You're a child of the Most High God. I'm working on a book called Almighty God. Wow. We better teach the people of God not who they are, but whose they are. Your daddy is Almighty God. Yeah. Your father, your daddy. You can jump in his lap and go, Daddy. Now, here's, a, here's a, this is good now. I'm telling you, no good thing will he withhold from those that are walking upright. So let's get a new idea of who we are. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the rightful owner of the entire universe. Hebrews chapter 1. He's the rightful owner of the entire universe. So when the devil goes, well, who do you think you are? You go, well, me and my older brother own the whole universe. <laughs> That's right. We're joint heirs with Jesus. Anything he has, we have. See, my people are destroyed because we don't understand who he is and what he's given us. It's time to get the robe and the ring back. It's time to be mature sons and daughters of Almighty God, taking over family business. Okay, well, listen, i got to get out of here. Uh, listen, I, I'm telling you, this is, this is something that God's going to give you that strategy you need. And you've, you've got a people that are ready. They're sick and tired of business as usual. God's sick and tired of business as usual. It, Last year, I'd be walking and change would fall. I mean, change. I'd be sitting at my desk. Change would fall. I'd be on an airplane. Change would fall. I got a stack of change this big round. Just fell. So finally, I said to the Lord, Lord, what's this? He said, you go back to the body of Christ and tell them change is in the air. Change. And he said, tell them their spiritual tomorrow will not look like they're today. Listen. He that started something good is going to finish it. He is author and finisher, not author and oops. You ever started something? No. He said, Philippians tells us he's, we're confident what he started, he's going to finish. Well, listen, this is a good day. Listen to what God says to you. Put it in your heart and activate it. The word that's not mixed with faith is just, it's not going to go anywhere. Could I, I, let me read four. I, I wrote down this years ago in one of my old Bibles. And, and listen to it. This is, this is some of the great men and women of God of old that talked about faith. You want to hear it? Yeah, here we go. Now, th this is one. This is Smith Wigglesworth. There are boundless possibilities for us if we dare to act in God and dare to believe God. Boundless possibilities. Wow, Jesus walked up to me once. He said, Bobby, I give you my personal permission to attempt to exaggerate what I'm about to do. So I said to him, I need a verse for that. He said, no problem, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask, we dare to imagine. Now that was Smith Wigglesworth. This is Catherine Kuhlman. Y'all remember Catherine? Catherine used to come out on the platform and she'd swirl around. And she would say, she says, have you been waiting on me? I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. I say, no, ma'am, I don't think so. <laughs> now I've tried to buy up every one of her old videos. Listen, a mighty woman of God. Listen to what Catherine Kuhlman said. The only limit to the power of God lies within the individual. The only limit is the limit we put on him. Wow. Now here, here's Catherine Kuhlman again. It is when active faith dares to believe God to the point of action, something has to happen. Something You get your faith mixed with the Word of God and put it active. Something's going to happen. Now, if this, was, if this was gasoline and I had the lid off and I had a match, something's about to happen. <laughs> I used to put on those street shows. We made uh, adult beverage. <laughs> you could run your car with it if you needed to. But 
I'd put on street shows. I'd take me a big swig of it, and I'd take out my Zippo lighter and go, Phew. I could blow fire from here to that camera. Phew. It was going real well once till I inhaled. <laughs> Had a back flash in my lungs. The doctor said it looked like fourth stage, uh, um, not pneumonia, pneumonia, that's what it was. That, you know, putting on a side show, that's crazy. <laughs> Let me, now I've got to get that out of your mind and get you back here. <laughs> it is when active faith dares to believe God to the point of action. Something has to happen. F.F. F. Bosworth said, faith begins where the will of God is known. You find out what God's promised, you bring back his promises to him. He'll move heaven and earth to fulfill his promise. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into. God's got big stuff in show, and he wants us to take over this planet. Yeah, yeah. As my father sent me, now I'm sending you. As he is, so are we in this present world. We're on a mission. But I love this. I love the people that you're rallying around you. I like the team that you've got together. I'm really, isn't this something? And just to be honest, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm serious. I'm serious. That's what the Lord told me. I, 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 was, I just celebrated 50 years, or so there's making a real big deal out of it. So I, I was before the Lord, and I said, oh, Lord God, I want to thank you for all these 50 years. And he blew me away. He said, you ain't seen nothing yet. And he gave me a verse out of the Bible that says, all that we have seen from history past is but the mere fringes of his voice. All that we've heard from history past till now is the faintest whisper of his voice. All that we've seen is but the outskirts of his doings. All that we've heard is the faintest whisper of his voice. Who dare contemplate when he roars? Listen, the best is yet to come. Aren't you glad? Now, I appreciate, I appreciate all that we've seen in the past, but that's just the outskirts of his doings, the mere fringes of his voice. That's what it says in the book of Job. You, you could read it. I like Job. Whew. Jesus appeared to me and said, suppose you missed the whole message of the book of Job. Instantly I knew I had. <laughs> Job is about the faithfulness of God, not about bitter betrayal of friends. You find out Job, the whole theme of it in Job 1 in the last chapter. He started out the greatest man and ended up seven times better than that. God finishes what he starts. Well, listen, God bless you, man. Come up here and listen. I want a hug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, they say, don't give nobody. Yeah. Hug them up, man. You know what we're going to do with this coronavirus or whatever you call it? Let's do Psalms 91.11. Yeah. Psalms 91.11 says, no plague will come near my dwelling. Yeah. Psalms 91.11, no plague. That's right. Let's stand up and thank God for this.